Well, welcome back to uh, Campbellsville Baptist Church and our Bible study as we look at a survey of the New Testament. When last we met, we had uh, been looking at the book of uh, Luke, Luke's Gospel. We've looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke in a very brief uh, survey. And so now we want to look at uh, Acts. I'm going to Acts now rather than John because Acts uh, is uh, a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. And scholars often refer to Luke and Acts as just Luke-Acts because they are, um, they are very closely related, Acts being the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. You remember that when we looked at uh, Luke's Gospel that we uh, said that Luke's Gospel was a Gospel of promise and fulfillment. And we saw the purpose of Luke's Gospel in Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4 where Luke writes to a fellow by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus is uh, a uh, Hellenistic Jew, and uh, he is someone to whom uh, Luke writes, and he tells Theophilus, and no doubt others like him, he tells Theophilus that he is writing a, a gospel of his own, an orderly account of the things that have been handed down to him by eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And he tells uh, Theophilus, that he's going to write an orderly account of them. And the purpose of that was so that uh, he might know of the, uh, most translations say the exact truth or the certainty, but the better translation there is the pledge, the promise uh, concerning the things that he had been taught. And so we said that Luke's gospel gives uh, Theophilus and others like him a a promise, a pledge. Luke's gospel basically answers the question, how will I know that God's word to me is, uh, will be fulfilled? God's promise to me will be fulfilled. And he writes to Theophilus so that Luke might know, um, have this promise, this pledge, that the gospel will spread despite opposition. And that the preaching of the gospel will spread despite opposition. And we have, uh, we looked at Luke uh, and we looked all throughout uh, Luke's gospel at all these various promises and all these various fulfillments of those promises. There are two that come in particularly uh, uh, that are very important for Acts as we continue. And that was the promise that we saw in Luke chapter 21 and verses 12 through 15 where uh, Jesus and the disciples are sitting there in the temple vicinity and Jesus begins to talk about the destruction of the temple that is to come. And the disciples naturally ask, well, when are all these things are going, when are they going to take place? And then Jesus goes through a lot of things that uh, will take place before that happens. And he also says, this is going to happen to you. Uh, he said, you're going to be brought before kings and governors on account of me. And he tells them, you know, don't worry about it because that's going to give you an opportunity for the, your testimony. That's going to give you an opportunity to tell them about me. And I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to give you an utterance that no one can uh, dispute or refute. And so there's that promise, which I call the climactic promise. And as we see, we're going to see this uh, fulfilled in the book of uh, Acts because in the book of Acts, you have uh, the apostles, the disciples, appearing before kings and governors and magistrates. Um, you're brought before them because of Jesus, because uh, they are preaching Jesus. And uh, it does lead to an opportunity for their testimony uh, and the like. Also, we saw the, uh, what I call the promise par excellence in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. Again, very important for the book of Acts, uh, where uh, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going to ask my Father to send the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, you go and you wait uh, in Jerusalem. You wait in the city uh, until the Holy Spirit comes. And so this promise par excellence, the Holy Spirit that he promised that the Father would send, uh, he does come, and he comes in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13, and he fills uh, the apostles with uh, himself, the Holy Spirit. And they begin to uh, 
speak of the mighty wonders of God, and they begin to supernaturally speak uh, languages of the, of the people who are there in uh, attendance, and they use it as an opportunity for preaching uh, about uh, Jesus, and uh, it be, starting with Peter, and uh, they, they do preach. So as we consider book of Act, the book of Acts, the purpose is really the same purpose that we saw in Luke's gospel. It's wrapped up in that, Luke's chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. And like I say, these two promises, uh, they are very important for the book of Acts, this climactic promise that we find in Luke 21, verses 12 to 15, and also this, uh, this um, um, promise par excellence that we saw in Luke 24, verse 49. So just like Luke's gospel, our author is Luke. We don't know from where this book was written. I would date this book in the early A.D. 60s, sometime shortly written after the Gospel of Luke. Uh, again, the, uh, the recipient is Theophilus, this uh, likely a Hellenistic Jew, and, and others like him, you know, Gentiles. And the purpose, like I say, is wrapped up in Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. Now, Acts, uh, in particular, is going to show the sovereign spread of the Gospel the sovereign spread of the gospel, the Holy Spirit who comes to fill these apostles is very much at work. It's going to show the, 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 the sovereign spread of the, of the gospel with all bold speech, bold preaching in other words, with all bold spree, uh, speech amidst great opposition. And uh, we'll see that all throughout the, 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 the book of Acts. The sovereign spread of the gospel with, with bold preaching, bold speech amidst great opposition opposition. There are uh, three basic terms. I like to focus on these as I uh, teach um, on Acts, uh, and it's not my purpose here to, uh, to use alliteration. It just turned out that way. But there are three motifs that are very strong in the book of Acts. For instance, uh, prayer. There's a huge emphasis on prayer, and we'll see how this works out here when uh, we look uh, hopefully at Acts 4 here a little later. Uh, also, there's proclamation. Now, that's bold proclamation. And along with prayer and bold proclamation, you also have persecution. So uh, prayer, bold proclamation, and persecution, those are three main themes that you find in the book of Acts. And a key term in uh, the book of Acts is a word, parousia, parousia, and also its uh, verb-related cognate forms. Uh, Parasiatsamai, in other words, uh, uh, bold, boldness, uh, frank speech, bold preaching, preaching boldly. And so that's a key term. A lot of times when uh, translators translate this word parasia in the book of Acts, they use the word confidence. Uh, that's, that's not quite it uh, in these uh, contexts. It, it's more the idea of frank speech, bold speech, bold preaching. And we see that all throughout the gospel, the uh, the book of uh, Acts again, which is a sequel to Luke's uh, gospel. So, as I say, one of these promises, the promise par excellence, is when the Holy Spirit comes, and we find that in the book of Acts in chapter two and verses one through thirteen. There, the disciples they are in Jerusalem, just as Jesus uh, commanded. Uh, before his uh, ascension, uh, and uh, then Jesus ascends uh, into heaven, and the Holy Spirit um, comes. Uh, he says uh, in verse 8, uh, for instance, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Just by way of digression, uh, there you might find a very brief outline for the book of Acts. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then the, the remotest parts of the earth. Uh, Acts covers all of the, those areas. And after he had said those things, he ascended into heaven. So they return to Jerusalem, the disciples do, and they are there in the upper room, according to uh, verse uh, 12 of uh, chapter uh, 1. And in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost occurs. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, this is verse 1 of chapter 2 of Acts, they were all together in one place, and suddenly 
there came from heaven a noise like, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit was a mighty rushing wind. It said that there was a noise that accompanied, accompanied the coming of the Holy Spirit like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them, that is to the disciples, tongues as of fire distributing themselves. themselves. Now here, uh, the word tongues doesn't refer to a language or anything like that. It, it's more the idea of as an extension. You know, when I was a little boy, I had a red wagon, as a lot of kids do when they're uh, smaller. Uh, and uh, the wagon has a, uh, uh, you know, the handle, that thing's called the tongue. And it's an extension of the wagon so that you can pull it. Well, there appear on these, uh, these disciples, uh, there appear to them tongues, extensions, if you will, as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they began to speak with other tongues, other languages. Glossa is the word there. Uh, they were supernaturally speaking languages that had, they had never studied, they had uh, never learned uh, supernaturally, they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And verse 5 of uh, Acts chapter 2 says that now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. I'll bet it did. And they were bewildered, and here's why, because each one of them, each one of the disciples, well, each one of the people in the audience, rather, was, was hearing them, the disciples, speak in the, their own language, his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They're from Galilee. How is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born? And then in verses 9 and 10 and 11, we see some of the people groups that were there on the day of uh, Pentecost, it says there that there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Galatia, uh, Pontus and Asia rather, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. They say, we hear them in our own tongues, our own languages, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. What does this mean? Uh, well, um, uh, others were saying, well, they were mocking and saying that they're full of sweet wine. In other words, they're drunk. They've been drinking. But Peter, he stands up to preach, and it off offers the perfect opportunity to preach. Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, this is Acts chapter 2 and verse 14, raised his voice, and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. So in verse 15, he basically says, it's only, it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. You know, they're not drunk. They're not drunk. But this is what the prophet Joel spoke about in Joel chapter 2, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my Spirit up upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And uh, so Peter begins to preach, and he begins to preach about Jesus. For instance, verse 22 of chapter 2, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So he's not out to win friends and influence people necessarily. He just tells them, you killed him. You put him to death. Verse 24, But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says to him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so I will not be shaken. So he preaches. He preaches a sermon. And then we see that 
uh, moving ahead there in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 3, uh, as the disciples were preaching uh, and the, some miraculous works of God were taking place, Peter and John, they go to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame there from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and he would sit there and he would beg for alms. When he sees Peter and John about to go into the temple, he begins asking to receive alms. In the words, he wants money. But Peter, uh, it says, along with John, fixes his gaze on him and says, Look at us. And he began to give him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter says, I don't possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raises him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And then I like verse 8 of chapter 3. With a leap he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him, and uh, him uh, walking and leaping and praise, praising God. And they recognized him as the man who used to sit there at the temple gate begging. Peter preaches his second sermon, uh, similar in many ways to the first, but uh-oh, Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested. And they were arrested according to, to verse 2 uh, because the, the, uh, the Sadducees, the, the priests and the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they, that is Peter and John, were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of from the dead and they laid their hands on them and put them in jail until the next day um, so uh, they are being persecuted they've been dragged before uh, they've been put in jail here and as we see as we go down further in uh, Acts chapter 4 they are uh, they appear before authorities uh, Annas the high priest Caiaphas John Alexander everybody of high priestly ascent and they're asking, by what power have you done this? And, and uh, then Peter again, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, shares the gospel and he tells why uh, they're doing this. And he says in verse 12, there's no salvation in anyone else because there's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. And so uh, as they observed the boldness of Peter and John, verse 13 of Acts chapter 4, that they were uneducated and untrained men, not dumb, just not formally trained, they were amazed and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had absolutely nothing to say. But the, what they do? They threatened them. They threatened them. That's what they did. They ordered them to leave the council and uh, they, uh, they tell them no longer to speak in the name of Jesus. Verse 18, And when they had commanded them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John say this, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than, than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they were threatened further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened, because the man was more than 40 years old in whom this miracle of healing, this lame man, had been performed. So there you have persecution for bold proclamation, two uh, motifs that we find repeated in the book of Acts. And then I always really like this passage here. Verse 23, when they, that is Peter and John, had been released, they went to their own companions, in other words, back to their apostolic band, and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, notice, they, they go to prayer. They go to prayer. They're, and it's united prayer. They're there with one accord. So uh, they say this. Notice that they fill their minds with thoughts of who God is before they ever ask God for anything. Notice what they, they say. O oh Lord, and now this is not the normal word for Lord. This is a word that means sovereign Lord. Uh, 
Lord who is in control of all of life's circumstances. Sovereign Lord, Lord who is not surprised by anyone or anything. The, the Lord of all who knows everything that's going to happen. The Lord that uses events for His purposes. O oh Lord, this is the word despotes instead of curios. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and it's all that's in them. So first of all, they fill their minds with thoughts of who God is. Here in particular, that He is the creator of the universe. He's the Lord of creation. Not only that, but they recognize Him as the sovereign Lord of revelation, who by the Holy Spirit... Through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, and this is Psalm chapter 2, this is Psalm 2 that they cite, Why did the Gentiles rage, and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So here they refer to uh, this Davidic psalm, that the Holy Spirit that inspired David to write this uh, psalm, they refer to this psalm, this psalm in uh, Psalm 2, it, uh, it tells of opposition to Jesus. It tells of coming opposition to the Lord's Messiah, to the Lord's Christ. And so uh, they recognized God as sovereign Lord, uh, creator Lord, uh, Lord of Revelation here, who by the Holy Spirit said this. And this has got to be very comforting to them as they, can, before they ever ask God for anything, they, they remind themselves of who God is. You know, if God before us, who can be against us? That, that type of thing. Then they also recognize Him as uh, the, uh, the God who, uh, who uh, has uh, pre-appointed all of this, the God of history, if you will. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Lord, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, now catch this, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and whatever your purpose predestined to occur. So, this, this has to be very comforting, like I say to them. They recognize God as the sovereign Lord, not surprised by anything, and in control of all of life's circumstances. He's the God who created the heavens and the earth, the universe. He's the God who has spoken in the past concerning the coming opposition of Christ. He's a God of revelation. And not only that, but He's the God of history. And He uses people whom we would see as uh, evil. He uses them, I mean the very people that uh, help to put uh, Jesus to death, to do whatever His hand, whatever His purpose predestined to occur. It was God's purpose to have Jesus die on the cross, and He used Herod, and He used Pontius Pilate, and He used the Gentiles, in other words, the Romans, and the people of Israel, Jews who were opposed to Jesus, to do whatever He wanted them to do, to do uh, what He had in mind as far as His purpose concerning Jesus. So uh, again, and I think that's probably something we should do as well as we uh, pray to God about anything, is to remind ourselves about just who God is. Uh, he, he, um, he, he's, uh, he's a Lord who's in control of uh, everything. That's very comforting. Only after they have finished and filled their thoughts with um, who God is, only after that do they begin to ask God for anything. Now you might think at this point in time, after Peter and John had been jailed and threatened, and then they go back and tell their group about uh, what had happened, just because they were preaching about Jesus, that uh, they might... Uh, uh, get all in a tizzy and begin to be very fearful and say, you know, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, God, deliver us. Uh, but that's not what they do. That is not what they do at all. Again, this word Lord. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. In other words, just, just consider their threats. It's not a prayer for deliverance. Take note of their threats, Lord, and grant that your bondservants, in other words, them, 
your servants may speak your word with all. Now this translation, New American Standard says confidence, but it's better rendered here, like, just like I said earlier, with all boldness, with all bold speech. Grant that your servants may speak your word with all bold speech. So the very thing that gets them in trouble to begin with, that gets them threatened, that gets them thrown in the jail, they pray for more of that. They pray that uh, help us to preach all the more boldly. Now help us to uh, speak your word with all boldness. They also ask God to work in verse uh, 30, while you, God, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they, they ask uh, uh, God to, to work, to do signs and wonders, to work mightily. So uh, they're in hot water for their faith and they take the opportunity to, uh, to pray to God. They do so with one accord. Uh, they ask God, just note their threats. They ask uh, God to help them preach all the more boldly and then they ask God to work mightily. And we see in verse 31 that when they had prayed, instant answer to prayer here, when they had prayed, the place where they were, had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Boy, that was an exciting prayer meeting, I know. I began to speak the word of God with boldness. You said, well, uh, I don't see any immediate answer to prayer about uh, you know, God working mightily uh, with uh, doing signs and wonders and healing and, and the like through the name of Jesus. Well, turn over to chapter 5 and verse uh, 12. And there we see in chapter 5 and verse 12, it says that at the hands of the apostles... Many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico, in other words, Solomon's porch. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly being added to their number. In other words, God continued to save people he continued to add to their number. Verse 15, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and they laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow, his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities and the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. And so we see these three motifs here in this Acts 4 account. You can go throughout Acts and find a lot more of that, but you see prayer, bold proclamation, bold boldness, preaching the Word of God, and you also see persecution. Every one of those elements are there in Acts chapter 4. And uh, after that passage I just read in Acts chapter 5 about many wonders, signs and wonders taking place amongst the people, many people being healed. Uh, again, we have persecution. Chapter 5 of verse 17, but the high priest rose up along with all the associate, his associates, in other words the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. Uh, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go stand and speak to the temple, in the, to, put to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. And so they began to preach again. So uh, Acts is such an exciting book. It talks about the sovereign spread of the gospel with all bold speech amidst great opposition. So I hope you've enjoyed our brief uh, survey of uh, Acts. Uh, let me invite you to Campbellsville Baptist Church. We have uh, Sunday morning services, Sunday evening services, 10.30 and 6 o'clock uh, here at, three, at 420 North Central. You're welcome to join us at any time. Uh, 
We have Sunday school that starts at 9.15 a.m. on Sunday morning. And on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. we have prayer and Bible study. I do hope that you might be able to join us sometime. We'd be, would love to see you. Father, thank you that you advance your gospel. Help us to preach your gospel all the more boldly uh, as the day approaches. Use us, Lord, in sharing the faith, seeing people come to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You take care and God